In our last video, we replaced the leaky power supply on this dead Tatung Einstein, bringing it to life. But the floppy drive doesn't work, making an awful grinding noise. The disc that came with it is 100% jammed in the drive at a funny angle. But we're going to open it up and see if we can fix it. Right now. Mark fixes stuff. This video is sponsored by PCBWay. You can get an instant quote on a variety of services, or browse a library of talented makers' designs add them to your cart and have them delivered directly to your door. First we need to disconnect the data and power cables from the drive. It's fairly simple. The 3 inch disc is stuck halfway in the unit meaning the eject button doesn't eject and the disc won't slide out. We can actually see scratch marks where someone has tried to prise the disc out at some point in the past. To remove the drive from its mounting sleeve, we need to remove two pairs of mounting screws on each side. They have shake-proof washers. Once those are removed, we should be able to remove the drive from the sleeve and get a better look at the problem. On the back, we have the data and power connections, but no screws, so I think we just need to get screwing. Let's go. This 3 inch drive model is different from the ones found in the CPC and Sinclair 128 ranges because it has a card edge connector like a 5 and a quarter floppy drive instead of the more common IDC connectors found in those other machines. This makes these drives uncommon and slightly hard to find. I hope we can fix this one in that case. With the screws removed, we can slip the unit out, revealing the workings of the drive. We can put the sheath to one side for now. Underneath we see it's a direct drive motor system, which means no belt to rot or go wrong. We can also see a handful of electrolytic caps, but I really doubt they're causing the problem. With the casing off, we can really see that the disc is jammed in at a funky angle and the mechanism is really skewed. We need to get deeper down inside to see what's up. I think that this metal plate will come off and it appears to be held on with these two machine threaded screws in its rear. These screws are different to the ones on the drive sleeve, so be sure not to mix them up. Always make a note of what screws go where, it will help you during reassembly. Lifting up the plate, my first reaction is that the insides are not a pretty sight. Oh dear. The metal chassis of the drive has been physically and forcefully twisted with the ejection runners completely bent out of shape in their channels. This is very bad news. As we lift up the head load arm, we see that the felt pad is long gone, and that won't have done the disc yet or the magnetic head below it any faders either. Oh no. We can see that one side of the runners is wrecked, whilst over on the other side, its partner stayed in place but warp the side of the chassis. To release the disc, we'll need to force the runners upwards. Underneath the drive, there's meant to be a corresponding lower set of runners, but this one is missing. And the other is jammed. Using brute force and my boyish good looks, I push the mechanism down against the jammed runners. It's tough on the old digits, but I can get my fingers in deep enough to get the captive disc out. And the diskette is not looking great with multiple obvious signs of damage. Even with the disc out, the drive can't settle to an insertion ready position. 
with the mech being jammed higher on one side than the other. In my experience, bending these back never works properly. The missing felt pad was meant to protect the disc and head from physical shocks. We find the pad rolling around in the dust, but let's try popping it back on anyway. You know, just for giggles. Trying to square up the runners actually made them a bit worse. In my experience working in a manufacturing environment with drives, bent drives never worked well and they ended up jamming a lot. It's not looking good fixers. We can see here evidence of the many levering attempts and just how off level the internals of the drive really are. With all this in mind, I think that this drive will be unrecoverable. However, that doesn't mean we can't see if we can at least get a test read off of a disc. To that end, we'll pop the bezel off of the front of the drive to see if it will allow us to slip one in. Even one of the bezel clips has been snapped by all that levering. This poor floppy drive has been through an arduous ordeal of physical knocks, but we should be able to get a disc properly seated, if only manually put in place. Sliding a diskette in and forcing it into position, I tried to read a known working disc. But we just got that noise again, the head never stepped and we got a disc not ready error. The drive head position mechanism is driven by this motor and it's jammed. It's simply not moving and that's what's causing the noise. A worm screw should be driven out at this point but nothing's happening. We have drive rotation, which is good, but as we can see, the head mechanism simply won't budge, so the head can't seek the disc or home the head, causing a read fail. Using a top secret technique I learned in my diskette duplication days, I try to free the head mechanism using gentle persuasion. but it's to no avail, so I finally slip in my fingers and rotate the mechanism to free it up. After a few digit driven turns, it starts to move quite easily. Powering the drive back up and that awful noise is now gone. The head travels to the home position, so let's try that disc again. Fingers crossed. Ugh, this mechanism is really wrecked. And no real progress, but a different error, proclaiming that the disc had no sector. To rule out the media, I tried the original jam disc. Well, you know, just for a giggle. This time we had a weary message of bad data. I can't say I'm surprised. I'm sorry to report that this drive is not going to be repaired and we really need to look at other options. I hate failing a repair, but I'm afraid this drive will never meet the standards we require due to its physical damage. So a GoTech looked like the only option, but before that I put out a call to a friend. And that friend, Mr Simon Green, came through again. In his pile of treasures, he found this EME101, which should be a direct replacement for the broken drive. It comes with this great instruction leaflet, detailing connections to the computers of the time. We can have a proper look at this in another episode, but it's quite fun, listing all the different interfaces and interface vendors of the day. Inside the polystyrene, we see a drive that looks pretty much brand new. It probably didn't ship in a plastic bag, but other than that, it looks mint. And it's a heavy old beast. 
solidly made by Matsushita in around 1984. High quality stuff. The front bezel is free of gouge marks and the rails are unmutilated. The drive head looks like it's never even seen a floppy and the drive select parameters are easy to set with this bank of dip switches. Around the back we have the all important card edge connector and the Molex power connector. And once again this is a direct drive model meaning no nasty rotten belts to change. This should drop straight into our Einstein so thank you Simon. One thing I did notice is that the layout of the rear connectors is different. These are horizontal. And when we compare the rec drive to the new drive, the new drive has an under over configuration. But even back then they seemingly accounted for this and I think, well I hope, that the sheath lines up with no modifications needed. Let's see. It's actually perfect and all the connections are lined up with their holes ready. We just need to put these screws in partially because they'll cinch the drive into the mount built into the machine. Ready and looking pretty good. Doing an uncabled dry run to see how it fits, I can honestly say that I'm really pleased with how the drive looks. Having a new drive just adds something to the Einstein. After popping the power and data cables into their respective ports, it was a little bit more tricky to get the drive into place. I got there eventually, but I really should have remembered that the uh, power supply wasn't screwed in. The screws with their all important shake proof washers secure the 3 inch drive in place. Apologies for camming out. We can insert and eject a disc. Such luxury. <laughs> Let's slip it back in and see if we can get it working. Our Einstein boots with the message, no file. Oh no. But in reality it's not a problem and means there's no bootable file on the disk. Typing DIR and hitting enter gives us a listing of the files on the disk. And typing that file name and hitting enter loads that file. The drive LED looks promising and I'm overjoyed when Chucky Egg loads and bursts into song. I'm genuinely happy that this machine now has a working drive. But we all know that magnetic media has a finite lifespan. It's rotting and the discs are becoming rarer by the day. So what can we do? Well one solution is to move to digital, so in the next episode we're going to fit this GoTech. And there will be some challenges to overcome, like this IDC connector. So we'll need a new cable. But fear not retro computer purists, for the plan is to move the vintage floppy drive over to bay 1 so we can access original media and then for future proofing we'll install the GoTech into bay 0. We should then be able to archive files from real floppy disks to digital files for posterity. And probably piracy. I'm upset that we couldn't save the original drive but happy that we have a working vintage drive now thanks to Simon. 
Thanks, Simon. And massive thanks to my amazing patrons who stick with me through thick and thin and make these videos possible. You can join them and help the channel at patreon.com forward slash Mark Fixes Stuff. Look at them all. What a sexy bunch. I really should bring the gummy bears back to work, but the only problem is I don't trust them to stay off that gummy beer. Oh, they're terrible on the gummy beer. Anyway, go and watch all my videos on repeat, please. Go on then, quick.